night you heard me talk about my wonderful wife's stuffing it's one of my favorite things she makes this wonderful stuffing it usually happens just once a year so pastor sean he's coming through the line and he looks there and he sees the bowl full of stuffing and he looks up at me and he says now i know this can't be all the stuffing because you wouldn't put it all out here in this bowl you saved some back at home didn't you in some little box you know what he was right <laughs> my wife just before we brought things over she says I'm going to keep this little one back so that you got some for later on. And uh, I wondered how he knew that. Uh, I don't think it was prophetic. I think it's just him knowing me you know, over the course of the time. Then you kept some back, didn't you? And I do, you know, they, they don't call it comfort food for nothing. And it does bring comfort, doesn't it? I love to eat that food. And, of course, then it makes you, any of you eat that turkey and mashed potatoes and stuff. And they say turkey has something in it that makes you sleepy. 
and uh, I don't know what it is, but there's some kind of chemical or something that makes you sleepy. And uh, so we're going to have some, uh, it, it's good to go back to that comfort food. It does bring comfort and it's something that's familiar, but yet it's always very wonderful as well. We're going to have kind of a comfort food passage this morning in this sense. It's one that everyone here no doubt has heard before, that we've talked about before. But I've studied it more in depth over the course of this week and it's been a blessing to me. And I pray we bring out, some, there's some new things that uh, I've never seen in the passage before as it is that I studied it. And I pray that it's a blessing to you. And I pray that unlike the turkey that uh, may cause you to drift off, I hope it, it uh, invigorates your spirit. Of course, I was tell, talking to Sister Sharon this morning, said I remember Brother Paul. Brother Paul, I may remember our Brother Paul. And he went on to be with the Lord. In fact, uh, Sister Sharon was reminding me, it'll be one year ago this Wednesday that he went home to be with the Lord. And uh, he used to tell me, he always called me Brother Pastor. He said, Brother Pastor? I said, yes, Brother Paul. He said, if I, if I drift off on you this morning, it ain't because your message is born. It's because I trust you. That's <laughs> but we're in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. If you're there this morning, say amen. amen. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, says this. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him, that is near to Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were not happy that the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus because rabbis and respectable people, in their mind, didn't hang out with such kind of folks. And Jesus did hang out with such kind of folks. Now, some might say that Jesus watered down his message, but he never, they might accuse him of that, but Jesus never watered down his message. Some people today think that that's what you do to attract folks under the gospel is water down the message. Jesus never did that. Read the end of Luke 14. I won't take the time this morning, but Luke 14 comes right before Luke 15. Read Luke 14, 25 to 35, and you will find that Jesus is telling the crowds that if you don't hate your father and mother and children uh, in regards, and, and by hate, he didn't mean that you would hate them and want, wish them ill. He meant compared to your love for God, it ought to outweigh your love for anything or anybody else. And how many know that's true? And Jesus said, unless you do that, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And then he went on to say in Luke 14, 25 to 35, you've got to take up your cross. The cross was an instrument of death. Unless you take up your cross and follow after him, you could not be his disciple. So just before it says that the sinners were coming to Jesus, Jesus lays it down. I mean, in very stark terms, Luke 14, 25 to 35. So Jesus never watered down his message. But the sinners would come to him because he would receive them and he would offer them Forgiveness, not forgiveness without repentance, not forgiveness that says there's no sin, not forgiveness that would say, oh, everybody's just, no, he would offer them forgiveness. And the very fact forgiveness was offered implies that there was a transgression that had been performed. In other words, if there's no transgression, there's no need for forgiveness. If there's no fallenness, there's no need for forgiveness. If there's only goodness and no badness, there's no need for forgiveness. But how many know human nature apart from Christ, we are lost and undone without God and His Son. There's none righteous, no, not one. All our good deeds are as filthy rags. We could do nothing to earn the grace of God. We need His forgiveness. Amen? Amen. So here it is, is that the, the religious leaders aren't happy that Jesus receives sinners unto themselves. And look at verse, uh, unto himself, look at verse 11, 3. So Jesus told them this parable saying, now you'll notice in your bulletin if you have it opened up, that I skip down to verse 11. And verse 11 is the most famous of this three parables that Jesus tells. But many of you familiar with this passage will know that when Jesus addresses the religious leaders, in other words, their concern that he has, their, not just their concern, their indictment that Jesus would receive sinners, Jesus tells three parables, the first of which has to do with sheep. He says there was a shepherd that had a hundred sheep, 99 of them, they're safe in the fold. One is out astray. And what does the shepherd do? The shepherd leaves the 99, goes after the one. Now, if you read Old Testament law, the shepherd would have to give account for the sheep because he would have to account for them if they were uh, somehow uh, uh, 
you know, if they were, had been killed by a predator or if they had been stolen by a thief, the shepherd in the Old Testament had to, the law had to give account for the sheep that were under his care. So the shepherd going after this one sheep not only shows God's love. How many are thankful he'd go after the one that was off on the hills away, right? And so it not only shows his love for the sheep, but it shows his diligence and his character that he goes after this lost sheep. And when he finds the sheep, they come back and what do they do? They rejoice because the shepherd found the sheep. Then the next parable Jesus tells is of a woman who had ten coins. And it wasn't just that she had them tucked away in a box somewhere. She had, the women back in those days would have a, a, a headdress that would have ten coins and it was the price of their dowry. And she had lost one of those coins. So it was very important to her to find this coin that had been lost. She went in. Now, back in those days, they would have largely one room houses with no windows. So it would be very dark. So she had to get a light, come into the house with the light, sweep high, sweep low until she finds that one lost coin. And when she does, she is so happy and thankful and they have a rejoicing a party because she's found the coin. Now, in this same way, now verse 11 tells a story that we call the prodigal son or the lost son. Beginning in verse 11, the most famous of these three parables told in Luke 15 says this. Verse 11, Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. So the younger son of these two sons comes and says to his dad, Dad, I want what's mine. And I want it now. Now that's very disrespectful, especially back in those days because they were much more respectful of elders and of course the fifth commandment. You realize the ten commandments, right? The first four deal with honoring God. The last six is our relationship with one another. And do you realize even before thou shalt not kill comes honor your father and mother? Commandment number five. And here it is, is he broke that commandment. He wasn't honoring his father. In fact, he's basically telling his father, drop dead. You being alive is in the way of what I want to do with my desires. He has been given, has the younger son, he's been given all that he's ever known by the beneficence, the benevolence, the goodness of his father. And yet here it is, is that he's basically telling his dad, I want what's mine. I want it now. I wish you were dead so I could do what I want to do. I want you out. You being alive even is in the way of what I want to do now. How many know that that's basically what a sinner is doing? Every good and perfect gift they've received, James 1, 17, everything they have ever known, they might take credit for it in the pride and arrogance of their heart, but the only reason they've ever enjoyed any good thing, any good moment, any good day, any good provision is because God has allowed for it to happen. And yet what does the person that's rejecting the gospel of grace do? They basically, they feel like they are entitled. Nothing will shoot uh, salvation and gratitude in the foot like entitlement. A sense of entitlement. He felt it was owed him. Give me what's mine. The portion of the estate that belongs to me. Give it to me. And give it to me now. And you very being alive is in my way. How many know there are very there are people that say they don't believe that there's a God, but Romans says they are merely suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. God has implanted into them to know that there's a God. He's given them creation. He's given them conscience of which we spoke three or four weeks ago to know that there is a God. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why do they want to deny that there's a God? They want to deny that there's a God so that they can live how they want to live and think there's no one to whom to give account. But how many know someone can do that in their mind? Someone can do that in their heart all they want to, but it does not change the fact that there is a God before whom all will stand. And here it is. This one, this younger son, he wants his stuff and he wants it now. 
The way it would have been divided is of all the family stuff, the, the dad having two sons, the older son, when the dad died, would get two-thirds of the family's inheritance, and the younger son would get one-third because he was younger. And the younger son says, I want mine, and I want it now, and I'm entitled to it, and get out of my way. James 4, 6 says, God is opposed to the proud. Entitlement means you're proud. Entitlement means as well you're not thankful. Romans chapter 1 will tell us what is it that two great sins, people don't acknowledge God and they worship, they, nor are they thankful and they worship the creation instead of the creator. So this here it is, is that, that as Jesus is telling this, his hearers expect for that dad to say, <laughs> I brought you into this world and I can take you. His hearers expect that the dad's going to come and maybe rough him up a little bit and and, and just say, who do you think you are? I'm the dad and you're not the dad. And put him in his place. But amazingly, is that what the dad does? No. The dad gives him his share of the inheritance. And he does it right then. And then the son, as we're going to pick up reading, look in verse 13. He's going to let that son go into rebellion and, and, and endure the uh, uh, sufferings therein. And how many know that it amazes. Some folks will say there's no God. Why? Because he lets, his, he lets people run about in rebellion to his laws and to his ways. How many know God does let people make choices? And there's consequences that come to those choices. And he will let folks do that. But that doesn't mean that there's not coming a payday someday. It just means he has offered them... This extension of, of, of their will, of them making the choices. Now look at verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country... And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him. So the son had a terrible request that we looked at in verse 12. And now he goes into rebellion. It says, after many days he gathered things together. Now you got to have this in your mind. Sometimes we read through things too fast and miss this. Much of what that son's inheritance would be would have been land, would have been herds, would have been uh, things that weren't cash and money. In other words, it's not like the dad just said, okay, let me write you out a check. It's not like they had it all. We think of things like that, right? The bank, you write out a check, they go down. No, what the, the younger son would have had to do was he would have had to take him some time to liquidate in other words, to go out and turn the land that was his inheritance, to turn the, the animals that were his inheritance, he would have to turn them into money. He'd have to liquidate. How many know when you have liquidation, you don't get near as much back as what it's really worth, right? So he goes out and he liquidates this stuff. His bad reputation would be spread all over town. And what does the son do? But in his rebellion, he takes this. That, again, he hadn't worked for it or any of that stuff. It had been bestowed upon him. He liquidates it at a fraction of the price. And he goes out now. He goes to a distant land. That meant a Gentile land. For a Jewish boy to go to a Gentile land, bad news. This son, I mean, it's just, he keeps digging farther. He's disrespected his father. He's liquidated his inheritance. He goes to a Gentile land. He keeps digging farther. And while he's there, it says he squandered. The literal Greek word means he scattered. In other words, he went about scattering his inheritance around. In other words, the money he got. He scattered it all over the place in loose living. I like the way the King James says it. It says riotous living. And just doing all kinds of things of riotous living that one could think of. Okay, you can think of all kind of debauchery that's in this world. And here he goes to partake. Of all various and sundry sorts of it. But eventually he comes to an end of his inheritance. And then not only is he at the end of his inheritance. But to add 
to the strife that he's or the trouble that he's into, a famine comes into that land. If you read throughout Scripture, when famines would come, that's part of what would cause the boys of Jacob to go down into Egypt because there came a famine in the land. It's part of what would call Ruth and Elimelech, her husband, to flee from Bethlehem and go into the land of Moab. People would move when there was a famine. It was a terrible thing back in that day for there to be a famine in the land. When you come to later on in the kings, when it is that the enemy forces would gather around Jerusalem and they would keep food out and water out. Those people, even because there was a famine in the land, would resort to cannibalism. How many know people, when they don't have food, they'll do all sorts of things? We don't know much about that in America because even if we don't have steak, we might, we, we might just have hamburger. Even if we don't have um, spaghetti with sauce, at least we got some Raymond noodles. All, anybody who's ever been in college, say amen. <laughs> I remember eating a lot of those Raymond noodles. Okay, in America, we don't know much about this sort of thing, but I will tell you, when people get to such a point that there's absolutely nothing, there's a famine in the land, desperate times will call for desperate measures. And this Jewish young man that had wasted his inheritance, that was in a Gentile land, he now digs even farther and he joins himself he, as a day laborer for a Gentile man. And the original language there is he kind of glued like a leech to this man. And this man finally to get rid of him, he sends him out. Where does he send him to? To the pigs. And if you read in the Old Testament, pigs were unclean of the unclean animals in the Old Testament. And he ends up there and he's with the pigs and it says he would want to eat the pods. He's so hungry, he would eat the pig slop, so to speak. But that pig slop was inedible. Those pods were inedible. So he couldn't even get comfort from that. The pigs could eat it, but humans could not digest it safely. So here it is in his rebellion. He ends up in a terrible place where he's with the pigs. And then he begs, but nobody will give him anything. All these ones that he had spent money with and had spent money on. Now that he has nothing, they don't have anything either. And they're not willing to share it. They give him nothing. He is down and out. But how many know? Sometimes it is when someone is down and out and at the lowest of the low. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what it takes for them to lift up their eyes to the hills from where their help would come from. And here it is. Now look at verse 17. So this son had a bad request. He endured the trouble of his rebellion. But now here is a good part. Thanks be to God, he repents. Look at verse 17. When he came to his senses, King James will say he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he comes to his senses and what brought him to his senses, no doubt, is the miracle grace of God that God will grant him a, a spirit of repentance to which he yielded. He comes to his senses and he thinks back of his father and he says, my father's hired servants. Now, again, if you study in the Old Testament, there were certain laws for day laborers. You know, we have that still today, right? You can go to certain places and they hire day laborers who go out. They may do one job one day and one job the next day. And there were day laborers back in the Old Testament. And God said very specifically, if you hire these day laborers, don't mistreat them, but give them their wage at the end of every day. Because they're just a day laborer. You might not see them tomorrow. Be sure God said, treat the worker fairly. Give them his wage at the end of the day. But notice, this father, the father of this young man, didn't just give his day laborers their wage at the end of the day. But notice, look back in verse uh, uh, 17. How many of my father's hired men have what? Not just bread, but more than enough bread. His dad was known to be generous. He didn't just give the day laborers their wage. He gave them more than enough. He did over and above that which was required. How many are thankful our father has great love? Amen. And so here it is. The son, as he comes to his senses in repentance, he thinks back of his father's character. And I will tell you, keep this in mind. 
Even this son here, when he thought, you'll, you'll see why this is important later on. When he thought back of his dad, he thought of his dad treating the day laborers, not only fairly, but with more than enough. And he was going to go back and ask to be, humble himself, plead, beg to be like one of those day laborers. And what does he do? But he not only comes to his senses, he not only thinks of his father, but he acknowledges that he has sinned. He says, when I go back to my dad, I'm going to acknowledge that I have sinned against heaven and sinned against him. How many know every sin is ultimately against God? Yes. Psalm 51, after David had committed adultery and murder, he says, against you, speaking of God, against you and you only have I sinned. Now, by that, I don't think he meant that he hadn't committed sins against others. But ultimately, every sin is against God. Any sin that you and I commit to one to another, not that we haven't wronged each other, but all of us are sinners who have fallen short. And if I sin against you and you sin against me, we've all sinned against somebody. But how many know God sinned against nobody? God's the lawgiver. And the son, by saying, I've sinned against heaven, in his repentance, he has Thoughts of the goodness of his father. And he has thoughts as well of the terribleness of his sin. That he has sinned against heaven. Another way to read that is not only has he sinned against God. Who is in heaven. But his sins have been so much that they've reached all the way to heaven. How many know most people don't have that view of their sin? Most people think Hitler's sin reached to heaven. But my sin only reaches like to here. <laughs> How many know we, we, we can be, we can be uh, hard on the sins of others, but we justify our own sins. We judge others by their, by their uh, results, and we judge ourselves by what we perceive to be our motivations. And here it is, is that he, in true repentance, he did not belittle his sin. He didn't say, well, you know, there's others who have sinned worse than me. I know I've done bad, but there's some worse than me. He didn't say that. He recognized the terribleness of his own sin. And unless someone realizes the terribleness of their own sin, they will not truly repent before God and know the forgiveness that's available in Christ. He says, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And then what does he say? I'm going to arise and I'm going to go to my father. And in genuine repentance, there are some people that, that, that will preach a gospel that doesn't have repentance. I will tell you. You read throughout the New Testament, read throughout the ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of Jesus, and the ministry of the apostles in the book of Acts. And they will always say, how is salvation received by repentance and faith? Repentance and faith. And so here it is, is that this son, he repents. The Greek word metanoia means a change in mind, literally. But he not only has changed his mind about what he believes about his sin and what he believes about his father, but he has also had a change of heart and then he has a change of vocation because he goes from one place and heads toward the other. How many are thankful for repentance that God would grant and empower to those who would yield to the repentance that God would give? Now look here next. Look at verse uh, uh, 19. After he's, or well, verse 18, let's read. He says, I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Now look at verse 19. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Notice, he not only is going to go to his father and confess, but he's going to go to his father and kind of bargain a little bit. Say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. He's going to, that's what he has in his mind. He's going to bargain a little bit. Look at verse 20. So with his son, before we move on to the dad, the son had a bad request, the trouble in his rebellion, and then the, thank the Lord, repentance. But now look at verse 20. So he, that is this son, got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, this dad is the patriarch of the family. And we get the idea that he's been looking for his son. Day in and day out. Week in and week out. Month in and month out. Perhaps year in and year out. We don't know how long this was. We're not given any kind of time duration here. But when the dad sees the son. 
This son who had ruined his reputation in the community by liquidating all of his dad's assets. This son who would have shame that the people to which he would come back would expect for his dad to treat him terribly. They would expect for his dad to maybe not even receive him. Maybe call for him to be stoned. Maybe if it, on a good day he might receive him back as a hired servant. But never to be received back as a son. What does his dad do? He sees him afar off and before the crowd can get to him, before it is that the crowd can get to him to bring their accusations, before it is that the, the looks can come, what does the dad do? The dad runs out to him to protect him. from the, the dad takes the scorn upon himself that should have been upon the son by going to protect his son. He runs and a patriarch back in that time didn't run because it would be a sign of of uh, uh, not being uh, dignified. It would be an undignified sign. Because he'd have to take up. They dressed in robes back then. He'd have to take up his robe. And run. And he'd have to show his leg to get there. Now I mean, not in any kind of immodest kind of way. But that would be viewed. Him bearing his leg would be viewed as something undignified. Pastor Sean was here on Thanksgiving. And I came over to bring some things to the house. Before dinner was ready. When I came over. I still had on. Shorts and a t-shirt that I had there at the house. And if you're around here very often, you know I don't wear shorts very often. And Pastor Sean, he said, he says, I don't see you in shorts very often. I said, you won't an hour from now either. I've had to, I, before I come back over. Uh, you see, he said, well, there's nothing wrong with shorts. When you got his legs, there might not be anything wrong with shorts. When well, you got my legs, you're glad I'm wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, is that back in that day, they would roll up their robes and they would and to have to run. And for the patriarch to do that meant he was bringing him. He was being in the eyes of the people undignified. And then he ran to that boy. And what did he do? But he took that young man and he hugged him and he kissed him and then he hugged him and he kissed him. King James says he fell on his neck. And then he was just so happy. To say, you ever watch these videos where the soldier has been deployed for a long time? And they come back. I love those videos. They, I got to get a Kleenex box though about every time they show one. You know, on the news, they use 29 and a half minutes to tell you all bad news. And then maybe you get a half a minute good story at the end. If you persevere to the end, right? And they have this story sometimes about these these veterans that come back home and they've been deployed for a year or two. And as it is that they come back home and they show up at their son or their daughter's school. And the son or daughter doesn't know that they're going to be there. And all of it, but the principal or the school leadership knows. And all of a sudden in the middle of the class, here comes this dad that's been deployed for some time. And what does the son or daughter do? Jumps up. They don't care what their friends think. They don't care that they're going to, oh, that's a mama's boy or a daddy's boy. They don't care. Oh, they saw. No, they get up, they run, and they hug, and they kiss. How many know that's the father's love only to a small degree? It's even magnified more when you think of the heavenly father and of Jesus' love for those lost sinners. Said that he ran and he fell on him and he hugged him and he kissed him and he shielded him from the the, the, uh, uh, what the crowd would have to say or, or do toward this one of bad reputation. So he receives him and it says the father had compassion on him. How many have ever read through scripture and noticed that Jesus had compassion? And when it would say that he had compassion, it usually meant some miracle was about to take place. In Luke... Gospel chapter. In fact, this Greek word compassion in the Gospels is almost only exclusively used with God as the subject. And here it is, is that back in Luke's Gospel chapter 7, verse 11 through 17, Jesus is passing through a street and there's a young man that is dead. The widow of Nain's son. How many remember that? Widow of Nain's son, the funeral procession is going through the street. Jesus comes. And he has compassion, this same word. And what does he do? But the one who was dead is alive. He raises that boy from the dead. How many know as great a miracle as that was, this miracle written about in the prodigal son is even greater because he just doesn't bring someone the natural life. He's going to bring in the spiritual life. 
He has compassion on him. He receives him. And aren't you thankful that those who come unto him, he'll in no wise cast aside? Here it is, the father falls on him, hugs him and kisses him, and he probably still looks and smells like the pig pen. But his dad, is there wasn't hardly any place to take a shower, probably. And he still looks and smells like the pigs, but his dad comes there, falls on him, hugs him, kisses him. And now look at verse 21. The son said to him, remember the son had this speech prepared. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But notice verse 22, but the father said. Now, I have often noticed, remember I told you, I've preached about this at certain times throughout the course of the years of ministry. And I've, all, I've long noticed that here the son had this prepared speech and the dad doesn't let him get through it. But notice what parts left out. I had not noticed this until this week. Notice what parts left out. The son's speech was this. If you go back up to verse, uh, um, I'll find it here. Look up at verse 18 toward the end. Here's what the son's going to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's repentance. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. But now look at the bargaining part that we talked about a while ago. Make me as one of your hired men. Now, when they actually meet, if you look down at verse uh, 21, the son says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He confesses his sin. He confesses his unworthiness. What part does the father cut off? The father cuts off the bargaining part. In other words, he gets out part of his speech, but the father cuts off the bargaining part. And I don't think that's by happenstance. I don't think it's just that, you know, that's where... No. How many know when a sinner is saved, all we do, we confess that we're sinners, we confess that we're unworthy, but we cannot bargain with God and say, make me as... A... No. We don't bargain with God. We confess, but God's the one who forgives by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. God cut off the bargaining part because you don't bargain to have your sins forgiven. No, you confess and the sacrifice of Christ is what cleanses us from sin. Isn't that good news? Now look here, look next at verse uh, 22. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Now the best robe, he tells his servants, go out and get the best robe. Now, I don't know, but when we think of that, as I studied it more in depth this week, when you think of the best robe, you get the basic idea. Here's the son. He's not clad or he's not attired very well. He's been in the pig pen. He smells like it. He looks like it. And his dad's saying, go get the best robe and put it on him. But the best robe, it's not just a robe, it's not just a good robe, it's not just a wonderful, it's the best robe. Only one robe will do, the best robe. And the best robe referred to a robe that the father would wear, and he would only wear it during certain special occasions, like the, uh, the wedding of the firstborn, or when a certain special guest was over. The best robe was the father's robe, and he only wore it on special occasions. And when the father says to his servants, go get the best robe, he's saying, go get my robe and put it on him. There's only one robe that'll work. How many know when we stand before God, there's only one robe that'll work. And it's not the robe of your righteousness. It's not the robe of whoever you think is the best person you've ever known or read about in your life. There's only one robe that'll work and that's the best robe. And that's the robe of the righteousness that's found in Christ Jesus. Yeah. He says, get the best robe and then put a finger or put a finger on his ring. Put a ring on his finger. I'll get it right here in a minute. Put a ring on his finger, a signet ring. That means he's back in the family with authority to sign documents and authority to get provisions. That goes back to where Pharaoh gave Joseph a signet ring to accomplish stewardship and duties. And then finally, he says, put sandals on his feet. The slaves, the servants did not wear sandals. The sons wear sandals. And the father was saying, this is, my, this is my son. Aren't you thankful for that? And he's going to walk differently than he had in the past. Look here next. And bring the, verse 23, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Now the fattened calf, 
again, was only brought out for certain special occasions. They would have these calves that were bigger than, uh, fattened bigger than the others. As many as 200 people could have a serving off of this fattened calf. So he's going to invite a lot of people. And he's not inviting a lot of people to say, here is my, here is my wayward son. Here is my son and for the scorn. No. When, they, when those people come to join in the celebration, they're going to see a son who has the best robe. They're going to see a son who has a ring on his finger. They're going to see a son who has shoes on his feet. They're going to see a son who's been loved and accepted and forgiven by his father. Yeah. And look here next. Verse 24. For this son of mine was what? Yeah. Was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. Remember I told you that word compassion was used when Jesus raised up the widow of Nain's son from the dead? Notice, what does Jesus say about this son? Not just that he was lost and is found. He does say that. But he says he was dead and now is what? You say, well, that boy never died. How many know back in Adam, Adam, the first man, what did God say to him? In the day you eat of the forbidden fruit, you shall surely what? And yet you read, he lived many years past then. What was God talking about? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and following says that we are born dead in our transgressions and sins. You say, wait a minute, how are you born dead? That doesn't even make sense. Well, not if you just think about natural life, it may not make sense. How many know there's a lot of people that are walking around out there, their, their, their brain is thinking a little bit, <laughs> their, their brain is still working, their heart is still pumping, their arms and legs are still going, Lord knows their mouth is still moving, <laughs> all right, you have all this going. Uh, but yet, those who have not received the Lord, spiritually speaking, they are dead in their trespasses and sins. Dead. What did Jesus say in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus? If you're going to go into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Born again. Some translate born from above. It has the same implication that people, though they're naturally alive, they're spiritually dead unless they are in Christ. And if they are in Christ, then they have received eternal life. Born twice, die once. How many are thankful for that? It's talking about a spiritual death. And this son had been spiritually dead. But now he's alive. And that's good news. Amen. Amen. Now look here next. And they. The end of verse 24. And they began to celebrate. Let me say this before moving on to the last part of this. There are some people. That even when they come to. To faith in Christ. Somehow in the back of their mind. They think. You know. I know that preacher said. And God's word says. That there is forgiveness. I know that preacher says. And that word says. That that uh, I'm reconciled to God. I've been received by God. I've been restored by God. But you know what. He is just waiting. He is just waiting. For the right moment to bring up all my past sins and bring the hammer down on me for it. Anybody ever had a relationship with somebody that whether it's a friendship or other kind of relationship with somebody. And you just know there's always that elephant in the room and they are just waiting for the right moment to bang you over the head with all the bad stuff you ever did in the past. Anybody ever? Right? Ever had that? The, 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 the parent maybe that came and said, I can't believe you did it again. <laughs> but at any rate, can I tell you? When God offers forgiveness, he means it. He means it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God has accomplished by his grace. How many are thankful for that? And then by his grace we walk. Not, not, that's not a license to sin in the future. For he says there as well. That we're not to walk in the flesh anymore. We're to walk in the spirit. But aren't you thankful when God says. That we are forgiven for the things that we have done. He forgives us. And, he, and there's celebration. A lot of people when they think of God. Do not think of a God of celebration. 
And yet Jesus' first miracle was done for celebration, or part of celebration, of course, it mostly it reveals the gospel. But what better thing is there to celebrate than the gospel? Here it is. Jesus tells three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the lost son. And guess what they all ended with? Joy and a celebration. How many know? I've read the back of the book and there's the marriage supper of the Lamb and there's great rejoicing. Hallelujah! Let us rejoice and be glad for the Lord our God, the omnipotent reigneth. How many are thankful for that? Now, let's get to the older brother and we'll conclude. Look at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And what does the older brother do? He doesn't join in the celebration. He doesn't, oh, my brother's back. He doesn't have the same attitude of his father. Look at verse 29. I'm sorry, verse 28. But he, the elder brother, became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. Now I would tell you, the father ran to his younger son, didn't he? But did he also run to his older son? He went out of the house and went to his, to his, his older son as well and was pleading with him. How many know that shows God's word declares in the epistle of 2 Peter, it's God's will that none should perish, but that all will come to repentance. Now that doesn't mean that all will, because there will be those who reject his offer, but they won't be able to uh, somehow throw an accusation in God's face and say that, that uh, it's, it's God's fault or somehow that, that uh, blame their, their uh, lack of, of receiving salvation on God. Look here, verse 29. The elder brother answered and said to his father, look. <laughs> That's how it is. One word in the New American. Look with an exclamation mark at the end. Look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. Now I will tell you. Remember, I, you may not remember because it's been some time ago, but remember when the younger son came to his senses and said, I want to go back. How many hired men, day laborers that my father hired have not only what they should get, but they have more than enough because my father's generous. That was his recollection of his father when he finally came to himself and was repentant. Here's what the older son says. I've been serving you. That word serving there comes from the Greek word doulos. He says, Basically, I've been slaving for you, Father. He doesn't even view himself like a day worker. The younger son recognizes day work. My father treats day workers very well, and he treats his sons even better. But here it is, is that this elder brother says, I've been slaving for you. I've been slaving for you, serving you, the literal translation there, slaving for you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. How many know there's a lot of people, I've never, I've not done this, I've not done that. I never neglected a, really? That's hyperbole, exaggeration at the height. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. In other words, not only is this elder brother mad at his younger brother, but more importantly, he is mad at his father. He indicts the character of his father. The younger son, when he came to repentance and recollected about his father, he knew his father was a generous man. But this older brother, how does he think? I've been slaving for you and you don't even appreciate it. Don't even appreciate all this slaving that I've been doing for you. You never give me this and you never give me that. He is indicting the character of his father. He has the same arrogance and the same pride that his younger brother had when he asked for his inheritance before the dad had died. He's got the same arrogance and the same pride. And how many know that same arrogance, that same pride, that same sense of entitlement would keep him away from God if not repented of. Look at verse 31. And the father said back to him, Son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. 
But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Now I didn't put it there, but I'm going to read to you Luke 16 verse 1 because that's the end of Luke 15. Those of you who have your Bibles open instead of just uh, instead of looking at the bulletin, you have Luke 16 is next. That's the end of Luke 15. Luke 16 verse 1 begins this way. Now Jesus was also saying to his disciples. You say, Ben, what importance is that? Here's the importance. We have in the story of the younger brother, we have the problem. He rebelled. He was disrespectful. He sinned. He had retribution. He repented. He comes back. He's received. He's restored. He's reconciled. There's a celebration. But for this elder brother... There's no, in literature terms, there's no denouement of the story. There's no completion. There's no resolution of the story. The elder brother's upset. He won't come in. He's mad about his younger brother. He's really mad about his father. He indicts his, his father. His father pleads with him. But do we know, at the end of Luke 15, do we know, did the elder brother come back into the house to celebrate? Did the elder brother stay removed out in the field? What did the elder brother do? The story doesn't tell us, does it? And do you know what Jesus does? Jesus is talking in Luke 15. And by these chapter divisions were put in later. But Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, to the religious leaders, telling them this parable, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Jesus is talking to them. And basically the point is, you're the elder brother. These tax collectors and sinners, have they sinned? Yes. Have, are they confessing their sin? Yes. Are they repenting of their sin? Yes. Are they forgiven if they have repented and put trust in me? Yes. Are they restored if that's be the case with them? Yes. Are they forgiven? Yes. Is there celebration in heaven? Yes. But you're the elder brother and you have just as much pride and arrogance and you have not yet repented. And Jesus basically to his hearers says, now you decide. And he turns away from them. And starts talking to his disciples. He leaves it to them. How is this story going to end? I'll tell you how it ends for most of them. There were some who would come to faith. But do you know what some, most of them did? Most of them will reject Jesus' message. And just like that younger brother by saying I want my inheritance now. Was basically saying to the father drop dead. What, what, are, what did most of the religious leaders say to Jesus and, and to the grace that would be extended to him from the Father? Through him from the Father? What did most of them do? Well, just keep reading the gospel. They came against him. They called for his crucifixion. They wanted him to drop dead. And they crucified it. They called for his crucifixion upon the cross to bring that about. And you know what? God, so to speak... Not only in this parable, but literally, God, the Son of God, was willing to drop dead, so to speak, that you and I might be forgiven. But how many are thankful he didn't stay dead? Amen. Three days later, up from the grave, he arose, as I like to quote, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. And if you repented and put trust in him, he died that we might be forgiven. He gave us his robe of righteousness that we might have those filthy rags removed. He put new sandals on our feet that we might walk in a different way. He killed the fattened calf and there is one day going to be rejoicing like you have never known at any celebration you've ever been to in this life for those who put their trust in him. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. And for those who remain on the outside, it's not so. They'll never join in the party. They'll never know the best road. They'll never know the joy of being forgiven while they're in their own self-righteousness. They'll never know the glory of the wondrous attributes of God while they have indicted Him for what they feel like is that they judge God instead of God judging us. But for those who are his and are his children, there's a great celebration that awaits. And aren't you thankful for that? For he is the one in whom there is joy, in whom there is gladness, and in whom there is celebration both now 
and evermore. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we thank